Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Converting a Traditional Greenhouse to a State-of-the-Art Cannabis Facility. My name is Tony Lang, and I'm an Associate Editor at Cannabis Business Times. In today's webinar, you will learn about greenhouses as the best choice for large-scale cannabis cultivation and how converting a traditional greenhouse requires extensive transformation to be successful. Our experienced panel of experts will discuss all aspects of this process and the potential costs and pitfalls. To that end, we have with us today, Doug Brothers, Vice President at Wave Rider Nursery in California, who will provide us with high-level greenhouse design considerations. We have Bob Bruns, Director of Commercial Sales and Installation at Link4 Controls, who will talk about environmental control and equipment. And last but not least, we have Eric Harrington, the National Sales Manager for Greenhouse Applications at California Lightworks, who will take us into the world of greenhouse lighting. California Lightworks will also be one of our many exhibitors this year at Cannabis Conference 2023. So be sure to check out their booth if you plan to join us August 15th through 17th in Las Vegas. Uh, before we get going into these dynamic and wide ranging presentations, I just wanna make a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, you're going to see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. If you click on that, there will be uh, that will open the Q&A box. So please feel free to type in your questions as we move through the presentations. And we will do our best to get through many as many of those questions as possible at the end of the event. Also, just know that we're recording today's webinar. And we're going to send a copy of the video to all registrants via email in the coming days. And with that, I'm very pleased to pass the mic over to Doug Brothers from Wave Rider. Uh, to start things off for us here. Hello, everybody. My name is Doug Brothers. I work at uh, Wave Rider Nursery as a general manager and uh, head of uh, post uh, harvest and sales and marketing. Uh, let's move to the next slide. We'll get going. Converting a traditional greenhouse into a state of the art cannabis facility. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Presenting is myself again. Next slide. <laughs> Greenhouse modifications, what to look for, what to avoid. Let's start with what to look for when looking to build a, uh, or convert a greenhouse to a cannabis. Power for cultivation. The first thing you do is check is how much power the property has. Uh, each acre of growing, you will need a minimum of 1,000 to 1,200 amps per light, for lights and fertigation, environmental, and heating systems. Bed space about one-third or 35% of that of cultivation. Power for post-harvest. Power harvest or post-harvest electrical is a key factor. Buildings will need refrigeration and humidity controls for all compartmental spaces, dry rooms, trim rooms, storage areas, and distribution and vaults. Water, uh, review RO water and well uh, or city water supplies. Most growers use both or all RO to control fertigation depending on water quality. Budget 50 to 100 grand for RO. Next. Greenhouse modifications, what to look for, what to avoid. Lighting, the required levels of lighting will depend on the light available at your greenhouse location during the year. However, even the sunniest areas of the country, you will need supplemental lighting to get even yields across the year. Check if rebates are available, big potential savings in many areas. Greenhouse roof materials. Many older greenhouses will need new roof materials. Glass or acrylic is the highest performing. Glass acrylic can compete with indoor grows in some cases with uh, higher quality with less cost. Gutter height, minimum 10 feet. Best is 15 to 18 if you can. 10 foot works with an arch. Uh, the higher the gutter height, the less problems with humidity. Next. Greenhouse modifications, what to look for, what to avoid. Benches, fixed or rolling benches. Rolling benches give you 30% more grow space. Benches should have a trellis or netting system to support flowers. Blackout, curtains are necessary. See if rebates are available. Rebates up to 40% in some areas. Fertigation systems, Priva, Rootstock, Link 4, Etc. for a larger facility, dosatrons for smaller operations. Airflow and ventilation. The plenum positive pressure is a big advantage. Heating and cooling, pushing conditioned air through jet tubes under the benches, allow air to flow through the canopy and out the top vent or push pull air exchange from one side of the greenhouse to the other. Next. 
greenhouse modifications, what to avoid, power delays, just like I'm currently going through, waiting two and a half years right now. So make sure your planning takes into account to check with utilities on timeframes to get a power or natural gas upgrade. Natural gas can take up to a year to a year and a half in some areas too. And proper greenhouse structures, poly greenhouses or hoop houses, greenhouse. Lower quality flower typically are okay for outdoor growing, same quality and price point as outdoor growing. Keep that in mind. Lower gutter heights, gutter is under 10 foot, less temp and humidity control, risk of botrytis and risk of mold are highly elevated. Weak structures, lightweight roofs that cannot support weight or blackout curtains and lights. Inappropriate air conditioning, not corresponding to the local environment. Next. Ideal greenhouses, concrete floors with drains or gutters, rolling or fixed benches, plenum air handling room in the back, jet tubes with conditioned air under benches, recycled conditioned air, mushroom fans or 24 inch air fans, LED lighting, automated irrigation, blackout curtains, you can also add shade curtains, fully automated environmental control systems, 16 foot plus gutters is ideal, double roof vents are ideal, separate bays to keep cross contamination risk low. Next. This is an ideal greenhouse. I built this one about uh, three years ago at, uh, down the road at Ensignal Road. Uh, heating under the benches, you can see the jet tubes underneath, uh, fertigation rolling up to the benches on top, glass roof on top, obviously uh, California Lightworks LEDs down middle and individual blackout curtains for each one of those walls on each side, allowing us to keep either contamination or light levels into one bay. So this, this greenhouse is pretty nice. Uh, it's also got heated floors, which is very unusual. So, and the plenum rooms in the very, very back, and you see those two black squares in the back, those are recycled air vents, allowing you to bring inside air through the plenum room, re recondition the air and send it back out underneath the benches. Next slide. Vented bench top material, grid to allow airflow through canopy, either be plastic or the metal, net supports, which you see on either end in the middle, rolling benches, blackout curtains, top and sides. Next slide. Greenhouse, glass greenhouse with adjustable nets, gutters to remove excess water or recycle, under the bench condition air tubes. You see all those in the picture now. We added actually those little sliding uh, PVC sliders on the metal nets, which you can see right in front uh, on the right side of the picture. They slide up and down. So as the canopy grows, your net moves with the canopy, limiting two nets. Anything more than two nets causes a lot, a lot, a lot of labor. Next slide. Concrete main aisles and walkways allowing equipment and people to move easily. Ground cover on dirt areas keeping bugs and weeds to a minimum, but not having all areas in concrete contributes to more humidity inside the greenhouse, especially at night. If you do go with uh, ground cover, consider installing gutters to remove excess water runoff out of the greenhouses. Next slide. Uh, in uh, veg areas, you can get away with a little bit less of a, a fancy greenhouse, but uh, still need controls. And I just thought those lovely uh, mega drives on the back of the greenhouse show you the power supply to the lights. Next slide. Post harvest drying. This is a brand new room I just built a month and a half ago. Epoxy floors, insulated cooler panels with dehumidifiers and fans make a great dry room. These are sandwich panels, uh, foam. Uh, the plants are hung on uh, Z racks with a hanging metal mesh easy to harvest right out of the greenhouse, roll it right down into your dry room. And then uh, this picture is a little older, but I have about six or eight fans now inside that room with three de dehumidifiers total all the way around with controls. Next slide. Post harvest, key to success, uh, showing you just our Mobius system here with the conveyor belt and a, and a belt bringing it up in the air to bring it into the sorting machine. And you can see on the bottom, there's five different sort buckets. So it works pretty nice to just take hair cut off the plant. It's all we do to allow for uh, trimmers to trim a little bit more flower than typically on a, on a, on a flower. Next slide. Post harvest keys to success. Effective dry rooms are essential. Temp and humidity sensors. Sensor push is a good way to go with Wi-Fi capability. 
uh, efficient way of hanging your product, allowing you to move easily if equipment fails, rolling rack wall, tray on a pallet, et cetera. Got to have air movement. It's key to how your product finishes. Less air, more mold, more air, almost no mold. So make sure your uh, all leaves are moving throughout that dry room. Dehumidifier units inside would back up as the first two to three days, day, excuse me, humidity at 55% and dehumidifier at 50 to 55. After three or four days, you can move the humidity up a little bit towards 50 to 60 to finish off the plants in seven to 10 days. Bucking the flower after seven to 10 day dry down in the desired curing container for a few more days. We use boxes, it could be as simple as that, or you can go into totes with uh, burper vents on them or, or, or uh, buckets. What trim machine to buy to take off some of the leaves before hand trimming? If only hand trim, we average typically one to two pounds per day. Uh, if you use a trim machine, you could take off 75% of that leaf or so. A trimmer can trim up to three to five pounds per day, but be cautious. Each trimmer can eat up a, a plant or a bud pretty quickly. Next slide. Odor control. A lot of people have odor control issues with some of their cities or counties. Uh, I highly recommend this system. Uh, this is a, a chlorine dioxide system. It keeps algae from growing inside the drip tubes with less botrytis because it's going throughout the air of your greenhouse and less colds and flus, especially in your trimming areas and office areas. Um, so we'll get you the name of the company soon uh, that, that we can get for you. It's called Affinity. Next slide. Economic considerations. What range of expenses are involved? What are the main expense to consider in advance? What will a cannabis greenhouse cost to get up and running versus cut flowers or vegetables? Cannabis greenhouses from scratch will run you $75 to $100 a square foot to build with the uh, accessories I talked about earlier. Remodels can run up to $25 to $75 a square foot. How much more will you make if you install all the previous upgrades associated with cannabis? Having done this for many years, I found out that without these upgrades, you don't know what you're going to get. These upgrades will give you year round consistency, quality versus the risk of botrytis and mold, less yield can, can, and consistent struggles. Next. Economic considerations. What does it take to make money in cannabis? Do it right from the beginning, folks. That's the number one thing. Otherwise, you will be upgrading along the way and struggling all the time. It's super important to implement the right tools up front to have consistent, high quality flour with a great nose for your customers. What are the margins for cannabis versus cut flowers? With flowers and vegetables, you generally can make five to 10 to 15% margins each year with a rough estimate of 210,000 to 275,000 for flowers per acre or 750 to $1 million for vegetables, basil, et cetera, an acre. With cannabis assuming around $800 a pound, which is kind of on the low end because California is running between seven and 800 now, I thought I'd use my numbers. Uh, times two and a quarter ounces per plant. It runs somewhere between 1.75 and 3. So I use two and a quarter, a little bit on the lower side, just to be, uh, be a little more safe. 18,000 plants an acre. You will yield about 2,500 pounds of trim flour, not trim, but flour, with 60% tops at $800 and 40% smalls at 250. That generates 1.4 million per turn, times five turns, roughly around $7 million a year in gross revenue. Next. And I want to thank everybody, but uh, if you have any questions, we'll wait to the end. Thank, thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. Yeah, just a reminder real quick that if you have any questions for Doug, um, to type those in the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll get to those at the end of the presentations here. I'm going to turn it over to Bob Bruns at uh, Link4 Controls now. Good morning, everybody. This is Bob. I'm with Link4. I am uh, in charge of several departments there. I am in charge of uh, technical support. I am also in charge of installations and application engineering, along with some commercial sales uh, support. Uh, next slide. We'll cover uh, controls basics and how to operate controls. We'll talk about controlling specific types of equipment, uh, additional control features that you'll need to know about and considerations that growers should take when building their greenhouse. Next slide. So controllers are uh, an 
going to be an integral part of your project, though they'll probably one of the smaller percentage cost of your projects, I would recommend not cutting corners here. Um, the controller itself gets inputs. It gets inputs from sensors and it gets inputs from you, the grower. Without those inputs, the controller is not going to do anything. Uh, so the sensors have to be operational and the user or programmer needs to understand how the controls work with the products. Once the uh, controllers program properly, it's going to take the sensor information and output over to the signals to tell your equipment what to do, tell you your vents when to open and close, your roof curtains when to pull back and, and open up to allow additional shading, your blackout for uh, preparation to make sure you get the right uh, light periods during the day, and then your cooling and heating equipment to make sure that your plants are always happy. While it's doing all this, it's going to be storing this information. It's going to be logging it. With Link 4, we do all that on the cloud. So all of that information is always available to you and the management the teams at all times. And you'll be able to set alarm parameters for high and low temps, high and low CO2, high and low humidity. Uh, so you know when things aren't within the parameters that you set and you'll be able to make sure that things are operating the way they should be at all times and have that comfort level. On the right side of the slide is some sensors and we have um, our controller, our interface panel, which is very important, and then showing an HAF fan, which is just one of the many devices you'll control. Next slide. At the uh, greenhouses, there's many different types. There's natural ventilation uh, greenhouses, which just have roll-up curtains and, and vents, and you get a natural convection to the greenhouse. And that can be used in conjunction with a, a um, more traditional negative pressure greenhouse, but it is something that you're gonna run across when you go out there and start looking at properties. The most common, uh, Greenhouse you're going to come across is a negative pressure greenhouse, which will have exhaust fans on one end and a big pad wall on the other end, and that will use adiabatic cooling to cool your greenhouse. You'll draw air from one end of the greenhouse to the other. Typically, you shouldn't exceed about 96 feet, uh, and in that 96 feet, you're going to have roughly a seven degree loss in uh, temperature from one end to the other end of the greenhouse, provided everything is working right and you have proper airflow. A way to help keep that uh, differential down is using high pressure fog, uh, which will also provide additional adiabatic cooling. And you can put those lines uh, periodically through the greenhouse, keeping the temperature more consistent. More advances uh, have been made, and now we're doing a lot of positive pressure greenhouses. and the advantage of a positive pressure greenhouse is you can get more direct cooling to the spots that you want it using ducts and, uh, and tubes that allow you to get the air that you want where you want it. A lot of those tubes are insulated, so the air coming out at the far end of the greenhouse is the same temperature that you're pushing into the greenhouse, so you no longer have that seven degree difference. Also in the heating mode, these houses have a return vent and it basically works like an air handler where it recycles the air and gives you the ability to draw the air through the greenhouse and keep it moving and keep the air circulation and your, your uh, temperatures stable throughout the greenhouse. The uh, importance here is that you're, with the positive, you're getting laminar airflow in a vertical direction. So your air is going from below the plant and up and out the greenhouse when you're cooling which reduces the chance to push the, uh, <clears throat> the different diseases that the plants will get from plant to plant, like you'll have in a negative pressure where you're dragging the air all the way through the greenhouse. Next slide. Heating equipment. <clears throat> Most of the greenhouses you're gonna go to, you're gonna find unit heaters. These will be of multiple varieties. They'll either be gas or, or or propane, or possibly hot water. Uh, the hot water are fewer, but they are out there. And basically you provide heat, uh, either by having a burner run or by hot water going through a radiator and a fan behind it pushing air. 
that air is not gonna circulate through your greenhouse, which is the heater. You're gonna need another method to circulate it. So you'll either find a fan jet with a tube in front of it, or you'll find multiple HF fans in a racetrack pattern throughout your greenhouse to help circulate that heat. There are alternate means of heating. You also have uh, heating hot water or boilers, and those boilers service many different types of heating. It can serve the forced air heater I just talked about for the radiator style. It can be in the floor, like Doug mentioned in the one greenhouse they have. It can be radiant where it'll be a thin tube underneath the bench, uh, giving you a radiated hot water heat throughout the greenhouse. And it can also be rubber tubing directly below the plants. Now, when you're doing that method, know that it's heating the soil. So it's very important that you monitor the soil temperature and not just the air temperature. If you monitor just the air temperature, you can overheat the plants. Also, you have the ability to have a gutter melt. So if you're in a cold area where you're getting a lot of snowfall, you can have radiant tubes run along your gutters and you can do snow melt with the hot water to those areas. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> in any greenhouse, you're gonna struggle with either humidity or not enough humidity, depending on where you are. Uh, if you need to add humidity, the recommended method is high pressure fog. Uh, high pressure fog, when done correctly, you should not see the fog. You walk in a lot of greenhouses and you'll not be able to see end to end when they're fogging. If they're doing that, they're not doing it properly. You want to be able to walk in and feel the humidity, not see the humidity. And with proper control setup, you can achieve that. I have a site in Arizona where I'm maintaining 92% humidity at 78 degrees, and you never see a drop of fog. Uh, <clears throat> dehumidification is another very important aspect to your cannabis greenhouse, especially when you pull back the, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, light depth systems and you basically close in your greenhouse, you're gonna get a lot of humidity built up and you're gonna wanna get rid of that humidity. So you're gonna wanna have a way to dehumidify. There are mechanical methods with Quest dehumidifiers and things of that nature, or you can use the natural aspects of your greenhouse to aid with dehumidification and with proper setup, you can dehumidify your greenhouse without a ton of additional mechanical equipment. Uh, if you have the positive pressure style, you can put cooling coils in, in front of your fans and get additional dehumidification that way. You're also gonna wanna add CO2 in a greenhouse. Adding CO2 when you're in full cooling mode is probably not the most efficient use of CO2 as it's just gonna go through the greenhouse. But in heating mode, you can definitely add CO2 to your greenhouse. Next slide. <clears throat> Curtains are going to be a very important part. Uh, you have shade systems, which can come up to 80, 90 degree UV uh, reduction. So when you have that good glass roof on a hot, bright, sunny day, you're able to dial back the sun a little bit. And then, of course, you're going to have to have light depth in order to control your your photo periods and make sure you have the right amount of night and day to your plants. Next slide. Lights are gonna be a very important part of your greenhouse. Uh, you're gonna have winter periods where you need to light more, summer periods where you need to light less, but you're always gonna have to be able to add supplemental light to your greenhouse. You can't 100% count on what nature is gonna provide you. Uh, we show a California Lightworks light here where we can control spectrum and dimming. And the, <clears throat> the way we can do lighting is we can do strictly on off with scheduled times. We can do cyclic time where it turns on and off during the day. You can do supplemental lighting where if the sun gets shaded or it's a cloudy day, the lights come on sooner. And you can do daily light in integral where you monitor the photo, the uh, par getting to your plant and making sure you give your plant the same amount every day. Uh, you can also have dim to off and dimming 
on so you can do sunrise and sunset features and control the spectrum. Next. Irrigation is another key part of your facility. You're gonna to have to be able to keep those plants watered, and it's best to do it automatically, not count on somebody walking through the greenhouse doing it every day, though they should be looking. Um, you can do many different types of irrigation. If, when your plants are small, you may use mist as they get older, drip. Um, you can do drip, deep water, aeroponic, NFT, many different ways of growing, but the control system can handle them all. You can do it again off of just schedule. You can do it off of moisture content in the soil, accumulated light or vapor pressure deficit. Uh, all of these integrated through your control system. Next. Fertigation goes hand in hand with irrigation. Uh, you have the very simple method of a dosatron or dosomatic where it's just a siphon injector. You turn the water on, you have a you're, you're uh, injecting nutrients at a specific level. Not that easy to change, not that easy to tailor, but effective for a smaller operation. Uh, then you have direct injection for very large facilities. Um, we integrate seamlessly with the Anderson system. What's nice about the Anderson direct inject and other direct injection systems that are automated is you can go in and tune your nutrients without having to uh, get out there and manually adjust springs. Now, the other way that you can deliver is through batch injection. That's where you pre-mix your batch. The advantage of pre-mixing your batch is you know exactly what's going to your plants before you go to it, before they go. So your EC and pH temperature is 100% balanced where you want it before you deliver it to the plant. Now, with a good control system, you're always monitoring the EC and pH that's going to the plant. So even with the direct injection system, if you get your EC or pH way out of balance, you're gonna cut off your irrigation. But at that point, some of it may have got to the plants. With batch, that's not gonna happen. Next. Additional systems you need to consider are entryways, uh, positive pressure, maybe uh, air showers. We have the ability to have security integrated and access control, and also the ability with our cloud to enable who can and can't access your controls and make changes. And more importantly, as they're accessing the controls and making changes, you know who did it through the login, so you know who changed something. So if somebody changed something wrong, you can use it as a as a teaching moment and go back and train that person on, on why you don't want the temperature at 90 degrees or the heat at 40. Um, so you have a, a history of who made these changes. Again, you have alarming data storage journal and all through the cloud so you can do it anywhere in the world. Next. Important considerations. Um, make sure you have a competent electrician build your greenhouse. Um, don't use your typical residential electrician. Make sure they either have greenhouse or heavy industrial experience. Um, know how you want to control your greenhouse. Don't rely on the controls company or the electrician to tell you how to do this. You should know how you want to control your equipment. They'll just help you do it. Uh, provide all the equipment and staging that you want to the team so they can make sure they're set up right and purchase services and drawings when possible to help you with having a complete comprehensive system. And uh, then of course, preventive maintenance is so important. And like Doug said earlier, a uh, favorite saying of mine is, there's never enough money or time to do it right, but there's always enough money and time to do it again. Next. Thanks, Bob, appreciate that uh, presentation there. Um, just a reminder that we will be emailing this uh, video out to you, to all registrants in the next five to seven business days here. Um, and if you have any questions uh, for Bob or any of the other panelists, remember there's a Q&A box at the bottom and we'll get those answers shortly here. Um, but first uh, we have our last presenter here, uh, Eric Harrington from California Lightworks. 
Hi, everybody. Eric Harrington here, Director of Commercial Sales and Greenhouse Specialist for California Lightworks. Next slide. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, two terms that I'm going to be using here. Daily light integral DLI. That represents the total photons that strike a square meter of area in one day. So that's basically used for sunlight, which varies all the time. So we don't measure the intensity at any given moment. We measure, vary, or measure the total amount of photons that it delivers to the area in uh, to a square meter in one entire day. Uh, PPFD or photosynthetic photon flux density. PPFD is used for fixed light sources uh, that have a consistent output, even if they're varying. Our, the peak output of it is going to be measured in PPFD, uh, and that's total photons that strike a square meter of area per second. Next slide. Um, one thing real important to keep in mind is that even though you're, you're glazing maybe 90 or 93 percent transmission, that's not what you're getting inside the greenhouse because the angle of incidence of the sun, uh, the actual transmission varies with that angle of incidence. As the sun is low in the sky in the mornings and the evenings and even in the wintertime when it gets drops down, your transmission decreases because of that reflection, reflective light coming off of, the, of the, the glazing when it's at a low angle. So overall, over the course of an entire day and 12 months a year, your average is going to be around 80% transmission through into that greenhouse. And that's assuming new glass, uh, clean glass, clean polycarbonate, et cetera. If you've got dirty polycarbonate, old glazing, or if you've got uh, triple, even triple uh, glazed, it's gonna be a little less than that. Next slide. The uh, consistently, University studies show that yield increases with uh, DLI. You get 10% more DLI, you get 10% more yield. Um, that is up to an upper threshold of around, with cannabis, around 40 to 50 DLI, something like that. Uh, above that threshold, the yield still goes up a little, but it starts to, to drop off rapidly, the amount that it increases, and you start getting the potential for stress. So... Pretty much, I mean, if you're going from 40 to 45 DLI, which is a 20% change, your yield is, or 12%, 13% change, excuse me, your yield is going to go up 12 or 13% from 40 to 45. It's very, very uh, directly proportional. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of some of the targets that we would use for different crops, and you can see that cannabis is considerably higher at 40 to 45. Next slide. Now, this is really important. This is our DLI calculator. We will create one of these for you with your actual, those, those numbers at the top in blue, uh, that row is your actual DLI for your area. This is New Mexico. This one is done for New Mexico. And um, so we will generate this for you. And this will show you in your area with the DLI calc numbers on the side there, the PPFD supplementation numbers on the left uh, in the middle there. Uh, for each level of supplementation, it will show you as you go across the row, what mixed light DLI, that's sunlight and the lights together, what maximum mixed light DLI you're capable of getting in that greenhouse for each month of the year. So if you look at New Mexico, which is probably arguably the best sun in the United States, um, you will see that at say 400, which oftentimes we might use for tomatoes, you're still only getting nine months a year that's either green or gold. The green is between 40 and 45. The gold is 45 or greater. So that is that's that that range that you're trying to get to is 40 to 45 or better. And you'll see that there's about nine months at 400 at about it takes about 600 micromoles in New Mexico to get 12 full months of uniform yield between 40 and uh, or at least 40 to 45 DLI. The importance of this of having this yield in those winter months is that if you don't have it, your productivity drops off, your profitability drops off in those months. Oftentimes they're just not even really profitable to operate. Um, you have to lay off oftentimes trimmers, people like that. Uh, you don't have to, but you don't need them because your yields are significantly lower. So um, it's difficult to run an operation where, you're, where your yields vary dramatically. So it's a, it's a big help to try and get to that 12 month uniform yield mark, which in New Mexico is about 600. Next slide. This slide shows New York, which is arguably one of the worst areas for sunlight just because of the latitude. Um, and in New York, again, 600 is still only getting you nine months a year of 40 plus DLI light, you'll notice. And you have to go to 700 micromoles 
to hit 12 months over 40 DLI. And note that those, those gold 45s, those are 45 or more. So those could be 45, 50, 55. But um, this is assuming that you've got controls in place that are going to control it to a maximum of 45 or 50. And there are controls available for that, both DLI-based controls or just PPFD uh, photosensor-based controls. Um, so this is a really important decision to make is, you know, do you, and of course, part of the profitability is whether or not, what is the price in your area? This is assuming uh, about 800 to 1,000, which is where most of the mature markets seem to kind of end up at. Uh, so this assumes you'll be, you know, for over 40, you're going to be able to be successful and profitable, even at those price points. At higher price points, you know, you could get by with less. Um, it's important that it, initially most markets uh, do have higher price points. So the earlier you get into the market, the more you're going to be able to leverage that kind of windfall profit uh, to pay off some of the stuff that you're doing before everybody jumps in and the price is kind of stabilized to those levels that we see in most of the mature markets. Next slide. Okay, the challenges for a greenhouse, obviously sunlight is dynamic. So we're trying to, uh, you know, compensate for that to try and get a consistent DLI result inside the greenhouse. Uh, sunlight has an excessive amount of blue spectrum for flowering cannabis. Um, it's great for, for plant. It's great for hemp if you're looking for fiber. But if you're looking for flowers from the cannabis, there's an excessive blue light and sunlight. And so our lights uh, should try and compensate for that. Um, greenhouse environments are harsher uh, environments than indoor as a rule. Uh, you've got a, a, a significant humidity variability. You've got the sunlight pounding right on those lights. So if the drivers are integrated in the lights, they're going to have that sunlight uh, beating right on them. Uh, and power quality issues. Uh, they tend to be in remote areas that have more spikes and more problems. And oftentimes they'll use generators and generators can produce uh, sustained overvoltage, which is going to fry uh, uh, most integrated driver lights with a Mauve surge protector in them. Um, greenhouses, the truss heights vary a lot. And a lot of times you can have greenhouses that are 10 foot trusses. And that's very close uh, to the canopy with a green with a cannabis green uh, canopy of six to seven feet. Um, so you have to be really careful about what light you get and not get too high a power density on your lights if, you're, if your uh, truss height is lower. Um, and installing lights in greenhouses is a little more difficult and, and, and expensive than indoors because you've got to mount the lights and the conduit right on that unistrut that's running down or on the trusses themselves. Um, and then light fixtures, of course, block the sun. So uh, a challenge with lights is to try and get a light that has the minimum shade profile so that it blocks a minimum amount of sun for the amount of output that it has. Next slide. So the Mega Drive system was purpose designed for greenhouses. We built this originally for greenhouses and we took into account all the things I just mentioned. So the Mega Drive has a two channel dimming system, spectrum dimming system that not only dims up and down to compensate for the levels of the sun, but also can dim the blue channel first to try and increase the red mix in there to get that blue ratio down and, and improve your quality. And then especially in the winter time, if you have the higher light levels of six or 700 micromoles of supplement, um, you can get significant improvements in your quality uh, in those months by doing this two channel dimming. The Mega Drive's daisy chain design, having a remote driver uh, requires zero conduit and power drops over the actual canopy. This can save up to 80% in your installation cost. Typical power drop can be between 600 or 60 and $100 per light. So if you're comparing us to other lights, you actually you should add that 60 or $100 per light to their cost when you're comparing because our, we're not going to have that that expense in the installation. Um, the the 10 kilowatt mega drive has advanced power quality protection. So it can handle all the spikes that you're gonna see in a greenhouse from all the multiple fans and motors that you have in there, possibly even light, nearby lightning strikes or in particular over voltage from, uh, from generators that can fry lights. The mega drive shunts that over voltage or those spikes to a, a breaker as opposed to absorbing them. Um, remote mounting on the mega drive gets the sensitive driver circuitry out of the sun. So that's gonna make that driver circuitry last longer. Um, the mega drive can be mounted down the wall in the greenhouse, in the, in the actual grow room or the, the bay. It can be mounted in the hallway outside. If you've got a posi and you've got the plenums that Doug, were talking, uh, that Doug was talking about, you can mount it in that plenum area. 
Um, and reducing the driver out of the fixture reduces the shade profile. So ours is typically for the a four to 500 watt light, ours is about 40% less shade profile than other lights. So that in a 200 light bay is about, you had, they would have to buy, you'd have to buy about 20 more of their lights to get you the same amount of mixed light as with ours because of the amount of sunlight that those, ex, those lights would be shading with that, that higher shade profile. Next slide. So this shows you how the Mega Drive loops through. It's a DC loop, goes light to light to light, and then back to the Mega Drive. We have a total of 500 feet. You lose one light, it can go to 600 feet. So with a 100, 140 foot row, you still have another 100 to 150 feet. You could mount that Mega Drive away from the actual grow room. So you've got a lot of flexibility in where you mount it. Next slide. Next slide. So this shows you on the left, uh, 2000 power drops. Every one of those power drops could be 60 to $100 with a commercial electrician. Um, with the Mega Drive, literally you just have the mount, Mega Drives mounted on the wall and all the lights just chain together. In a typical one acre greenhouse, you could run upwards of $1.6 million with an individual driver, integrated driver light, uh, where with the Mega Drive, and this is a sample uh, install we had, it was only 0.9 million. Um, and that's mostly the end installation. Of course, the Mega Drive also saves in, in, in fixture and, and system cost as well. Next slide. So the Mega Drive, we have uh, a touchscreen controller available to control a very simple uh, hardware controller. We have wireless control systems, the cloud that's available. We have light sensors that can actually do photo sensor based dimming, or you can take light sensors with any of the third party controller type companies like Link4, like Priva, like Argus. Um, and a lot of them will have that photo sensor capability to be able to do that daylight balancing type of, of input. Uh, the Mega Drive takes a zero to 10 volt input, so it'll work with any control system uh, or our, our uh, uh, California Lightworks type controls. Um, next slide. So this shows you uh, actually the Wave Rider uh, installation we have, uh, Doug Brothers uh, facility there in Salinas. Shows the Mega Drives on the wall. You can see all of those Mega Drives. That's one entire row is one Mega Drive and 27 lights. So it's incredibly simple to put these in. They just all connect together and there's just one Mega Drive on the wall for that entire row of lights. So dramatic savings in insulation costs. Next slide. Again, you can see all the Mega Drives on the wall. This is a new POMO, um, uh, some lights. Next slide. Um, we also do all of the light plants for you, lighting designs. And one important thing, when you deal with us, you don't get a junior salesperson. If you call me about a greenhouse, you're going to get me doing your design. You're going to be able to talk to me about your grow application and your, and your needs and your challenges. Um, we don't just have junior people that are going to talk to you about it. We have extremely experienced uh, technical staff and, and people that can help you with the design, the layouts, talk to your contractors, your engineers, uh, et cetera. So, um, and we will generate the, all the lighting designs for you to get you the most, the optimal uniformity in your, in your design. Next slide. Uh, this shows you how you can do a mega drive with, with a row that's too long for like a 200 foot row. We can do two mega drives on one row where the first half of the row is one mega drive and the second half of the row is another mega drive. So there's really no limit in terms of how big the greenhouse is. Uh, the mega drive can accommodate that. Next slide. Um, so why California Lightworks? Uh, California Lightworks is the oldest company continuously selling lights in the United States cannabis market. We've been around since 2008. We're the, the, we are the oldest one in the business with over 40,000 lights in service and 20,000 mega drive lights in service in greenhouses in just the last couple of years. So it's been a very successful product for us. Um, we have industry leading experience and research because of all of that experience. We really understand cannabis and we can help you be successful in the cannabis industry. CLW designs and manufactures all our products in our factory in California. We are a truly American made product. Even our drivers are made by an American company uh, custom for us. California Lightworks provides 24 seven, 365 customer service. You get my cell phone. I mean, if you've got problems, I'm there for you. Um, with our partner FSG, we can provide complete turnkey installations, on-site service, and financing 
for projects throughout the United States and Canada. That's it, next slide. I thank you for your time. Thanks guys, really appreciate uh, those presentations and insights. Um, we're gonna open up the forum here to Q and it to Q and A. So if you have any questions for Doug, Eric, or Bob, you know, again, please type them in the Q and A box here, um, and we'll get through as many as we can in the next fifteen minutes. Um, first, want to start out with a question for Doug. Um, you mentioned rebates may be available for blackout curtains. Are those rebates related to reduction of heating slash energy, light pollution, or other factors? And do you have any advice on how to seek out those rebates? Yeah, uh, we just apply it ourselves. You can go through a, a greenhouse company typically to do it or directly with pg e rep of some sort. But the blackout curtains, we just received a 40% rebate uh, for all of our blackout curtains. So you also get it for shade curtains because pg e gives rebates for anything that helps uh, keep heat and um, natural resources inside the greenhouses versus letting it go out. So you could check with your pg e and check with your rep, or there's a couple of companies, you just type it in the Google saying pg e rebates on shade curtains. And also your cover for your greenhouse, if you replace your acrylic or, or poly, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but they'll give rebates on those too. Um, we have a question, uh, piggybacking on, on the rebates, we have a question if, any of, any of you are connected with Energy Trust of Oregon to apply those, to apply a, a rebate? Yeah, we, we, we all can work with any of the rebate companies, as long as there's typically some kinds of certifications on various products, DLCs for lighting. Um, as long as the lighting qualifies for that, you'll be able to uh, be considered for any rebate in the country pretty much. So yes, we, uh, we have, I know we've worked with Oregon Trust before. Right. And I think this question is for Eric. Um, basically, um, I am a licensed rec farmer in Oregon. I just built a 20 by 50 greenhouse with plastics film. Is there a system that is for larger greenhouses than mine um, that have glass instead of plastic like I have? Well, yeah, the, the Mega Drive, the beautiful thing about the Mega Drive is the lights are very lightweight. So our lights can literally work in a hoop house. I mean, very few lights are eight pounds like our light. It's very lightweight. So the load on the roof is lower than you're going to find with pretty much any other light out there, um, um, short of a really high power light that you put up on the roof. And those, again, you have to have a, a big distance from your canopy. So, Are you... Are you all seeing solar paneling, shading integration into newer greenhouse upgrades? Well, it's, it's very hard to use solar panels to run your lights for cannabis. Uh, you need about seven or eight times as much square footage of, of solar panel as lights. Um, it's great for remote areas if you want to run uh, you know, your pumps and stuff like that, you might be able to run it. But with if you're going to run lights in your greenhouse, the solar panels, you can run them and you can certainly run those or natural gas cogen is more common now uh, as a an alternative power source from the grid. But uh, in either case, uh, it's a significant uh, expense to get, you know, to, to do it that way. Um, we have another um, participant here is who's asking about reaching out for uh, tech support. You know, what's I know, Eric, you said that basically if people want to work with you, they're going to talk directly with, with you. Um, is there a preferred method for peach people to reach out to the three of you guys or your companies, I should say? So, so at Link4, we have a tech support phone number and we also have a email support at link4controls.com. Um, and if you go to link4controls.com, the website, links to technical support are also there. I think you guys are also providing the numbers and emails to us after the seminar, correct? Right, and, and, a lot, and just to make note that I think all three of you included your emails in your presentations, if I'm not, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in the slides. So we will be sending out those slides or we, the presentation, which includes those slides uh, in five to seven business days. 
So you'll have access to those emails when the video um, comes through. Um, and I got another question here that says, what about uh, GACP validation? Yeah, I'm not familiar. That's not ringing a bell, familiar. we can come back to that one. Um, do you guys have any suggestions on new greenhouse manufacturers you're seeing work well? We're expanding our indoor operation to greenhouses and just started the process. What state is the big question? Every um, well, state's got a little bit different. Some, some manufacturers go over state party lines, some do not, but there's certainly some in the East Coast, Midwest, and the West Coast we could recommend, but uh, unless they tell us where they're at, it'd be kind of hard to recommend somebody. Yeah, Mark, if you can tell us what state you're at in the chat. Washington, he's from Washington. That's a little tougher. Uh, I do know that like there's a company here in Watsonville called Systems USA. They go multi-state. Um, they build large glass greenhouses also. Bob, you know anybody in your yeah, area? So, so next gen will go anywhere in the country. They build right. uh, large greenhouses. They do uh, acrylic or polycarbonate roofing and glazing, and uh, they do the high pressure recirculating greenhouse also. Series works up there. They're really good at places with snow loads. They're especially good there out of Denver. And we all know um, Maryland is set to come on board with adult use this year or adult use sales anyways. Um, someone's asking, do you guys have support in, Mar is there support available in Maryland? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All 12, 52 states, all 50 states. Right. And the territories, I should say. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, would, would international inquiries be possible south africa zimbabwe switzerland so for link four it is we have controls all over the world we sell all over the world too i mean we have european representation not everywhere but we have european re representation australia we have representation uh, a little bit of representation in south america but not very 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 little sticking with you eric uh this question's for you uh fail Failing LED drivers due to heat sensitivity seem to be a primary, almost only downside of LEDs versus magnetic HIDs. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any progress or potential in this area? Well, obviously, that's why we, that's one of the key reasons for the Mega Drive. I mean, the failure, you know, you've got to try and put this little tiny driver, this power, high power driver into this very small light, you're trying to make it really small and you've got it out there in the sun. So by the mega, putting in the mega drive, we can make it much larger. We don't have to worry about the size constraints. We can get it out of the environment. So that was exactly one of the primary reasons we designed the mega drive the way we did was to try and absolutely make that driver reliable, You know, have the kind of reliability that you see in commercial lighting where you know one failure in a hundred thousand instead of a failure in a thousand. In your in your presentation, you had mentioned New York being, did you say the the, the lowest uh, sun light? For DLI, yeah, one For of the DLI. lowest because the, the latitude is so far north. Right. Someone's asking if there's any um, East Coast um, greenhouse recommendations that you have. Um, I think specifically maybe for New York that maybe don't apply to a, a state like Arizona. Uh, specifically for New York, um, well, I mean, every customer I got up there that's a serious commercial customer is talking 700 micromoles. I mean, if you're going to try and do business up in New York, I mean, in other states, you can kind of get away with less. You can kind of, but up and up there without 700 micromoles of light, it's almost impossible to be profitable and make it make sense. Um, you know, unless you got tons of snow load and conditions like that, then you might just look at closing those months, you know, and that has some manpower challenges, but that obviously is an option and that saves you some money in lighting and stuff like that. But um, there's that there, we've definitely got successful customers up there, several thousand lights up in New York burning right now, mega drive lights, and uh, they're doing great. And the prices are fantastic up there. So it's, it's a really good time to get in in New York and New Jersey both. 
Um, would you, someone's asking if you have a list of greenhouse builders in all states, um, but I think this person is specifically asking about Texas. Um, I do know what Trinity Greenhouses is down in Texas. They're in, located in Texas and they're very good. Um, as he said, uh, as uh, Bob said, um, um, next, gen. next Gen is all over the country. Systems USA can probably go into Texas as well. I would, the Trinity is very good though. And they're a very kind of a medium priced uh, product that's, that's excellent. And they're right there in Texas. All right, five more minutes here. So keep sending the questions if, if you have them and we'll get to them. Um, do you do you guys ha, uh, suggest avoiding retrofits whenever possible? Uh, no, depends what you're doing to that retrofit. <laughs> if you're uh, if you got a low profile greenhouse, then you might want to avoid it unless you could raise it. Uh, but if you have a 10 to 12 to 14 or 15 foot gutter, then retrofits are fine. It's just again, do it all right from the very beginning. Don't do half of it now and half of it in a year because you'll end up having too many issues and you're, you'll lose your, your yields and you'll lose your quality and you'll have a lot of mold and if you don't do it right. So that's what everybody did in California. We all jumped in with the California gold rush and 90%, 80% are gone now. And a lot of money has been pumped into California and it's gone because people didn't take the time to build their greenhouses properly or look for power or look for gas. So they just threw plants in and they all molded, you know? So a lot of issues can happen if you don't do it right, but retrofits aren't terrible. I think 90% in California are all retrofits. So uh, if you wanna build a brand new glass greenhouse and have the best, that's one thing. If you wanna use what you have, then you, you build it and do it right. What's the minimum distance from the ocean or sea a greenhouse should be and why? Hmm. If you have a if you have a distance in mind, so greenhouses will function anywhere. I don't know that there's a distance. Uh, Especially for cannabis, be, it, 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 when the greenhouse is set up properly for the environment that it's in, it will work just fine. Uh, there's greenhouses uh, on the equator. There's greenhouses in Saudi Arabia, and then there's greenhouses that thrive in Canada. So uh, there is not a a limitation to where a greenhouse will work as long as it's set up for your environment. Right. The, the ones that are close to the coast are because they were counting on the environment to do all the work for you. And with cannabis, you got to have lights. You got to have, you, you have to condition everything more than you do for most other crops and plants. So you're, you're much more flexible in the location because you are conditioning those envi that environment a lot more than you are with flowers or lettuce and the likes so i think if you're that close to the coast too and you've got a lot of fog influence then you're probably going to have to look into the desiccant side of controlling that house a lot more so than just heaters and fans right but if you're 5 10 20 miles inland you got to worry about the extreme heat so you know you, you got to find that sweet spot in the middle in california we have a lot of different climates but uh, you, again you find the right greenhouse and the controllers that you should be able to manage it And then someone's asking, is next gen in, in Michigan or are there any other greenhouse builders in that area of the country that you know of? So next gen is in Michigan. They have several facilities there already. And uh, you know, they go anywhere in the US, they'll build their one of their greenhouses and they have the specialty crews that go around and, and assemble the greenhouses in those locations. Okay. Maybe but one other one is, you know, there's some on the West Coast or East Coast that I know of, like the Van Wigerdens. One of the brothers has a greenhouse company. Uh, again, it depends on the type of greenhouse you want to build. Uh, you know, the manufacturers specif specifically do certain things better than others. You want a glass one, you need to look at a Dutch type, right? If you want a, a acrylic one, then you can work with many different suppliers. So, you know, so um, those are the uh, things you got to figure out what you want to do up front. Well, hey, I just want to say, you know, thank, th thanks so much uh, to the three of you, you know, Bob, Eric, and Doug for providing us a glimpse of your expertise over there, your three companies, and 
Um, if anyone didn't have their questions answered, uh, we'll do our best to pass those along to these guys and uh, have them try to reach out and get in touch with you. Um, but thanks to everyone for joining us. And again, appreciate the three of you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day, everybody.